Greetings, sisters and brothers. 
This weekend, at long last, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. After Christmas and Easter, the greatest feast in the Christian year, in the Christian calendar. And it's all about the Holy Spirit. And today, the title of our message is from Psalm 104, 30. Send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. And it's based on Acts chapter 2, the famous Pentecost reading. And the gospel is John 20, 19 through 23. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So sisters and brothers, imagine the scene. A large gathering, something we have not had in a while, right? A large gathering of people from every race and ethnicity and different countries and cultures speaking many different languages all gathered together in a big city for a festival, for a celebration. And it was the Feast of Pentecost. And for Jews, this was when they celebrated the barley harvest. Um, so if barley, if the hops are what beer's made of, there perhaps was drinking. Um, and also it was the celebration when they remembered Moses receiving the gift of the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai. So we're told that Jews from every nation, speaking many different um, languages, gathered in Jerusalem for this Pentecost uh, feast. And Penta is the, from the number five, and this is actually the 50th day for Jews after Passover. But for us Christians, Pentecost has become, has taken on a new layer of meaning. We come out of Judaism, so we still have that original meaning. But for us, we think of it as the day when Jesus sent this new infusion of the Holy Spirit upon his disciples who were gathered in Jerusalem. Remember, uh, last week we talked about these 10 days Jesus rose from the dead and appeared for, to his disciples for 40 days. And then he ascended and says, wait here until you have been clothed with power from on high. And they waited and 10 days later at the feast of Pentecost, they received, they were clothed with that power. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit in a new and powerful way. So for us Christians, Pentecost means the 50th day after Easter. Um, so we read that the disciples, and it says in Acts chapter 1, that they were the 11 disciples, along with the group of women disciples who had also followed Jesus around during his ministry and supported him financially from their means, that they all gathered together. Um, many think it was in the upper room where they had celebrated um, that Last Supper with Jesus. And it distinctly says in Acts chapter 1 that Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, was also present. And so I'd like to point that out. That's very important. And then we're told that the Holy Spirit came like a mighty or actually violent, like a violent wind and blew through the place where they were gathered and uh, tongues of fire appeared on the tops of all of their heads and they began speaking in various tongues and all those gathered uh, heard this tumult, heard this commotion and were shocked that although they spoke all different languages, everyone could understand what the disciples were saying because each one could hear it as though it were in his or her own language. Wow. That is what Pentecost is all about. So for us Christians, 
we think of Pentecost as really the birth of the Christian church. Because after this event, Jesus' disciples went out and were his witnesses in the world, filled with that power from on high. So let's look for a moment at the Holy Spirit and what we know about the Holy Spirit. So in the Hebrew Bible, the word for spirit is ruach, ruach, and uh, it, it, it is a she. The Holy Spirit is a feminine aspect of God, and uh, we know that the spirit was there from the very beginning of creation. In Genesis 1, we read the the wind, the breath, the spirit, ruach, was hovering over the waters of creation and all life came to be. Um, and so that word ruach in Hebrew can mean both spirit, breath, and wind. Now in the Greek of the New Testament, they use a different word, a Greek word, of course, and it's pneuma but there's a silent P at the beginning, like pneuma. Uh, we get the word pneumonia, pneumological, having to do with our lungs, with breathing, with breath. And again, that word pneuma, spirit, means spirit, Holy Spirit, breath or wind. The color that the church uses to celebrate the Holy Spirit in Pentecost is red. I'm wearing a red stole. Um, the dove descending is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and these flames. Um, and so we have the red paraments on the altar. I have my red stole. And so we celebrate this coming of the Spirit in a new and powerful way, clothing us with power from on high. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that a modern-day theologian, Phyllis Tickle, um, who died just a couple of years ago, but she and a young theologian, John Sweeney, wrote a book called The Age of the Spirit. And she wrote um, how she feels that in our Judeo-Christian faith, the first 2,000 years of our faith were essentially Judaism. And she says, for those of us who are Trinitarian Christians, we could say that First 2,000 years was the age of the Father, the Creator God, a powerful, um, mighty um, deliverer, patriarchal kind of God. Um, and that was the first 2,000 years. But then with the birth of Christ, we've now had two year, 2,000 years, two millenniums, of an, the age of Jesus Christ, Christendom, right? And for many of us, we find it difficult when we hear historians speak of our present age as the post-modern world or the post-Christian world. And But Phyllis Tickle says, do not dismay about that because she says... What we're, we're in the next transition, and the next couple thousand years, she proposes, will be what is called the age of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And we can see this. Um, before I was born in the 1940s and 50s, churches were filled to the brim, and people who were religious or not, all went to church on Sunday. That was the hub of people's, of community life in every town throughout the United States. In the town square, a church would be in the center of the square or several churches. And the church was the hub of social and community life in every town, village, city. And those of us who um, have come along a little after that see um, that things have changed. And today the church is not so central in many people's lives. Churches have been shrinking and membership has been dwindling and younger people 
we older people lament that younger people don't come to church anymore. And yet the Pew Foundation has, has tells us that over 90% of people claim that they believe in God, but many younger people say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church. Um, so we have to, so this would go along with Phyllis Tickle's theory that the next couple thousand of years may be a totally different um, stage in our spiritual development, and, it, and she calls it the age of the spirit. Another thing is people of my generation are older. When I was a kid, I had some Jewish friends, some Catholic friends, and some Protestant friends. That was it. Just one generation later, my children have Buddhist friends, Hindu friends, Muslim friends. Um, we now live in this um, multi-religious world of where people of all different faiths are, um, are here in our country. And so, again, it is a post-Christian world. But Phyllis uh, Tickle invites us in her book, The Age of the Spirit, to think about what will this next 2,000 years, what will this age of the spirit look like? And so reading her and um, Harvey Cox, The Future of Faith, and just from my own musings, um, I'd like to share seven signs that I think we will see, that we are seeing, and we'll see more in this next age, the age of the spirit. And the first one I'm going to call the breath of life. So spirit means breath. And when, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we should think of everything that lives and breathes is infused with the breath of life and is part of this Holy Spirit. Um, we humans have tended to place ourselves at the pinnacle of creation, and we think we're the best and the most developed of all the, uh, the forms of creation. But now we see how some microscopic, you know, microorganism can completely undermine us, right, and throw everything upside down. So are we really um, that powerful, or perhaps should we show more respect for all of life, for all living things, everything that lives and breathes and it has that breath of life? So I, I feel that the next 2,000 years will be marked by us appreciating the interconnectedness of all that lives and breathes, of all life forms. In the Native American religion, they speak about the web of life and how we are all intimately and intricately connected. Second sign of this um, age of the spirit. Um, in, the, in the book of Acts, we heard that the spirit is also wind and it's described as a, as a violent wind that blew through the place where they were all gathered. And I think of this, this violent wind which levels things and moves through and, and it wipes things out in order that then there can be a new beginning. And so I think there are many things in our present age that indeed need to be wiped out, like racism, sexism, LGBTQ phobia-ism, um, our uh, acting or thinking we're superior to the rest of the living beings on this planet. Um, all of these ways, uh, these isms um, need to be wiped out. So hopefully that Holy Spirit will be like a violent wind that will wipe all those isms away and allow us to have a new, more equal um, world going forward into the next two millennium, millennia. 
Along with that, a third sign of the Spirit would be unity in the midst of diversity. Um, in the second reading, it's from 1 Corinthians 12, and Paul writes about the Christian community as the body of Christ with many different parts. And he talks about how every single human being has been blessed with gifts of the Spirit to share for the building up of the whole. And let's face it, sometimes, um, well, even in his community he was writing to in Corinth, there were those who thought of themselves as so much better than everyone else. Their gifts were better. But what Paul distinctly says is those parts that we think are dispensable are not. They're very, very important. And so they are indispensable. And we've seen that during this coronavirus, right? Yes, doctors and nurses, indispensable, indispensable. But so also are others that we maybe wouldn't have thought of. You know, farmers and truck drivers and supermarket workers and uh, those who, uh, merchants and people who distribute our goods and services and especially our food, boy, we sure need them. They're indispensable right? And so this age of the spirit will be marked by celebrating the diversity, the different gifts everyone has to offer, but realizing that it's for the sake of all, for the good of the whole. Fourth, fourth um, sign of this age of the spirit in the, in the story from Acts, it says that though people were from all different cultures and races and ethnicities and languages, they could all understand as though it were in their own language. And a lot of Bible scholars have said, so what is this language? Is there some spiritual language that that all people can understand? And yes, we've determined that. Um, that it is the language of love. And in scripture we read in John 1 John 4 that God is love. So we will all learn to speak that new spiritual language and to live our lives in this love and this mutual respect for all, for one another. And um, I quote the Buddhist Thich Nhat Hanh, who says, there are two things that unite all people, deep suffering and deep love. And so those are marks um, uh, five of this, of this um, age of the spirit. We will go through some suffering because it's a transition. It's a giant paradigm shift. And um, we need to respect, as we said, all other life forms. And perhaps this coronavirus is waking us up and teaching us that we cannot continue to treat our beloved Earth um, the way we've been doing so because these are the, these are the ramifications of it things like this coronavirus as well as all of the all of the forest fires and floods and earthquakes and other natural disasters brought about by climate change but this language of love great love i remember when my son was a toddler i went here in town to the greenwich club and it's a pool club and there were a uh, bunch of moms sitting around this little kiddie pool and all of our toddlers were playing in the kiddie pool and when one kid like fell under the water like every mom like jumped into the pool to help that child didn't matter whose kid it was we were moms we spoke the same language the mom language the language of maternal love for our children and so this love, this language, this spiritual language of love does unite people. Every family throughout the world cares for their children, for their loved ones, and wants their children to have the best 
possible future. That is the language of love. The sixth mark of the age of the spirit. Um, my son, who majored in women's studies, has a t-shirt. It says, the future is female. <laughs> and I've seen it on other people, too. And um, the Holy Spirit is female. Um, it's the part of the Trinity that, that's female. God's neither male nor female. Jesus, male. Holy Spirit, female. We've had patriarchy for the past 4,000 years now. Um, hopefully, we'll go into a future where there is more of a balance between male and female and where the female side of life is honored and respected. In Native American traditions, when a tribe would go to war, um, it would be the women who would have the final vote because they were the life givers of the tribe. If you gave of yourself, of your body, and sacrificed yourself to bring new life into this world, you were the one who were, was to vote in terms of, is this worth risking all that I labored to bring forth and give life to? And if, you, if the women voted yes, under these circumstances, we need to go to war, then they would go to war. How different, right, if the future has this balance of female and male. Seventh, seventh mark of this age of the spirit is that just as we will honor the female, so we will more fully and reverently honor our beloved Mother Earth. We cannot continue any longer uh, treating the Earth the way we have been. Um, I watched 60 Minutes two weeks ago, and a scientist said, it doesn't matter if people don't believe in science. Science doesn't care whether you believe in it or not. Science is going to happen. Uh, if we continue treating the Earth the way we have been, it will be destroyed, but so will we. So will that entire web of life. So sisters and brothers, our native, uh, in native religion, they speak that every decision we make, we should make it thinking, what will the effects of this decision be on the next seven generations? In today's gospel, Jesus comes among his disciples, and he says, peace be with you. He blesses them. Then he commissions them and tells them to go forth and be his witnesses in this world. And then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit to empower them to do this. So sisters and brothers, we are witnesses of this spirit, this breath, this wind of life. May we go forth and be God's witnesses breathing new life into our world today. Amen. And my friends Rose and Annette asked that I give a benediction at the end of my sermons. So now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with blessing and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of Ruach Numa, the Holy Spirit. Amen.